In April of 1912, an extravagant passenger ship set off from the coast of England for its much-anticipated maiden voyage. Tragically, that ship sank days later after colliding with an iceberg. So today, we look at the story and conspiracies behind what is arguably the most famous ship disaster in history, the Titanic. This is Red Web. Welcome back, Task Force, to another episode of Red Web, the show all about unsolved mysteries, true crime. Today, we're diving deep into some lovely conspiracies. And if you've been around the block, you know we're the movie podcast about mysteries. And today, we're combining it all together. I'm your resident mystery enthusiast, Trevor Collins. And joining me hearing this story, these mysteries, for the very first time, Alfredo Diaz. Two things. Hit them. Three things. Get it? Actually. You okay. know what? I'll add a fourth. Love but it. But... As soon as you said iceberg yep. and ship, I went, are we doing the Titanic? Yeah, dude. Are I saw you telling me the eyes connected with the chair, our, <laughs> our lovely Christian over here and uh, Christian Young. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, so uh, that's, that's, hello, hello. that's one. And I was like, cool. Titanic. Two, Billy Zane did it. Three, James Cameron mm -hmm. is doing a whole, I guess, video or some I type of one off to show that, yes. that Jack could not fit on that door. He's at doing the that. End. Yeah. And he's re-releasing the movie, I think, around the time that this episode's coming out. It just so happens. Oh. Yeah. For Celine Dion, my heart will go on. Absolutely. Banger. Banger. Banger of the 90s, banger of the century. It was a 90s movie, right? It, I mean, it fit yeah. on two VHS tapes because I wore those things down, especially that in, the, like impassionate foggy print on the right, glass. That scene, I was about to say, like, is it yeah, okay? That scene's scene? got some magnetic damage to it because <laughs> it's been paused once too many times. But no, seriously, this I'm very excited about this. I loved this movie as a kid. I actually went and rewatched the full iceberg scene as seen on YouTube just like earlier today. Oh, okay. And the way they handle some of the details with like, and I'll get into it, but how the radio operators were talking to one another at the time. Obviously, they're filling gaps because mm -hmm. it's a movie, but oh my gosh, there's so many fun. I, I, I guess I'll say that. Fun conspiracies that are behind this. Otherwise, just straight up disaster. Right. I mean, at face value, but I like the idea that people are like, no, 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 something must have been a miss on purpose behind this. And we'll, so we're going to give the story around the Titanic, its origin, and then what happened but then address some of those conspiracies. This made me realize that's one of the cool things about mysteries and conspiracies, and more so this leaning towards conspiracies is the fact that you can kind of apply it to things. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So for this, it's the Titanic, where you yep. just go, it's a tragedy. Big ship hit big ice. Yes. Ice win. You oh, know, yeah. and you go, done. Yep. But yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's some conspiracies. Like, why didn't they see it on the sonar, et cetera? Right, and right. This and then they got the tech behind it and it was a big, massive, expensive ship. Yeah. Like, how are they not retrofitted with the technology in order to be able to see that? Enough lifeboats, all these things that we're going to dive into, mm -hmm. I think, create a perfect storm in which that's why we're going to address the conspiracies. People want to, if you had all the uh, bells and whistles, as it were, to to address the issues and and be fine... Then people go, okay, then maybe it's just a tragedy. But the fact that there's so many small little hangups that led to the tragedy, uh, like created room for people to go, well, then I need, I need to make an answer or find an answer. Yeah. So we're going to tell a story. We're going to identify some of those potential hangups and then talk about the conspiracies. I think we're going to also try to attempt to address the wrinkles with some of these conspiracies because oh, all not all of them are just straight up like, I don't know. Like, I think some of them like can be of, debunkable. Yeah. None of meat to back it none up. None of meat. Especially. But uh, but otherwise, they are interesting enough to to hear about, which is kind of our lens that we look through at Red Web. Okay. So, did they try and christen the boat with a bottle and it didn't break? They christened the boat with a man named Chris N. Chris Nicholas. <laughs> he uh, he swung around on the uh, you know the front where on the, the bottle. He the was anchor, the bottle. Yeah, he was the bottle. <laughs> he swung <laughs> on the anchor uh, like Miley Cyrus on a wrecking ball, <laughs> and um, he actually caused a weak wall. And that, that's, that's actually true. the main conspiracy. <laughs> there you go. So, now let's dive into it because uh, I feel like we all think we know the story of the Titanic, but rest assured there might be some details you don't know. So let's give the story of how it came to be, the maiden voyage, and then of course the conspiracies thereafter. So 
In April of 1912, the Titanic underwent its sea trials to determine if it was seaworthy. And of course, later that month, on April 10th, 1912, the Titanic set off from Southampton, England, on its maiden voyage to the Americas, specifically New York City. It was a luxury passenger ship that could carry over 2,400 passengers, as well as 900 crew members. The Titanic was the largest boat afloat at the time, measuring 882 feet long, 92 feet wide, and 175 feet tall, or if you prefer, 269 meters long, 28 meters wide, 53.3 meters tall, and it could carry up to 46,329 tons. Ooh, that's big. Uh, how many mm -hmm. passengers again? 2,400 passengers okay, could nine, fit. 900 crewmates. Yes. So it's Sorry, a when you total first, of 3,300. When you first talked about the Titanic setting its voyage and its course, and I went, okay, hold on. There's a good chance there's a handful of people at a dock in New York on arrival day just going, where the boat? Mm-hmm. And there's no boat. There's no boat. <laughs> Uh, it might have been a well, small they might have radioed I feel like it. they knew quickly. Right, they would and... radio it, relay it. Yeah. There's well, no we'll, boat we'll coming. All that, yeah. Oh, another thing I wanted to say, I meant to say this at the top, but uh, another special element to this, I went the extra inch, okay? I printed out some photographs that you can analyze at your leisure when we get to a particular conspiracy that has to do with the aesthetic of the ships. And so, like, I've got some, what I'm saying is I have some tactile evidence that you can get hands-on with. Oh, schematics okay. or whatnot? Maybe not schematics. They're photos, but... Uh, <laughs> you did say an inch, not a mile. Schematics would be a mile. Right, yeah, that, right, that is right. a mile move. Yeah. Never yeah. mind. It's an inch move. <laughs> but, I, you know, so it's like a, a little hands-on experiment for you. But we'll get into that. But coming back to the details... So, another thing. This, this ship is huge. It really is. But I've never been on a cruise ship, but I have seen photos of modern cruise ships next to this thing. Ships are scary big now. Have you seen like a carnival cruise line next to what would have been the Titanic, like scale wise? Oh God, no, but I bet it's massive, it's right? It's huge. Because they did try to put all kinds of things in there. Oh yeah. You just go on roller a cruise. coasters on the yeah, ocean now. It's exactly. Um, oh my God. Oh, did you just look <laughs> just it up? Looked it up, yeah. <laughs> Christian just looked it's, it up. It's gnarly. Um, but that doesn't mean that this thing isn't big. This thing, this right. ship right here, the Titanic. I mean, it's the biggest. Still huge. During that time. Yes. Um, is it running off coal? I believe so. Yes. Yeah, it's yes. got boilers, oh and that's what the four God, smoke they must stacks just be are. Shoveling like crazy. Mm -hmm. So this this ship in particular had nine decks. There were swimming pools in it and four elevators. It was commissioned by the White Star Line and was designed alongside two other ships, i.e., its sister ships. You have the Olympic and the Britannic. The Olympic and the Titanic, in particular, were much more similar to one another. The Britannic had a little bit more uh, nuance to it, like fancier. Uh, no, they're all about the same. Like, at a glance, they all look identical. Oh, okay. But what I'm saying is the Olympic and the Titanic themselves were even more, more identical. identical. Okay. Mm -hmm. They were also built before the Britannic. They were built side by side, hence a little bit more oh, familiarity. and Sibling design. boats, yeah. Yeah. So the ship's design was considered advanced and extremely safe. Of course, that's one of the things that prevails to this day is it's the unsinkable, it's a strong ship, it's not going down. It's impenetrable, right? All of that stuff. Oh, that's right. They did say that. And yeah. there's where the conspiracy and the mystery lies because yeah. then in, was someone trying to prove that it was sinkable? Here he goes. Oh Gut instinct God. in action. Watch it, Christian. Oh, thanks for the outline, Christian. <laughs> so the ship's hull or the body of this ship, the hull, I'm trying to not hull, the hull of the ship has 16 compartments with doors to contain water in case of flooding. So picture a boat, any boat, from above. These compartments are basically equidistant along the length of the ship. So if water were to breach just the very front compartment, you could have Kinda this just like... floods into the bottom and evens out the way. Yeah, you would close that off so the water could fill up one compartment and it wouldn't spread to other parts of the ship. In fact, it was said that this ship could continue floating and it would have enough buoyancy even if four of the 16 compartments were flooded, which is, that's pretty good. 25% of these could be waterlogged and they would still be afloat. But why, why have 16? I guess that they're in different areas, I'm assuming. Because you, initially my thought was, you have 16, if a quarter or more get flooded, that's it. Are you but saying add more walls? Like add more? No, it's just like, why wouldn't it be built for, to house 16 out of 16 with water? 
and be. Oh, well, I don't think any boat can. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. And I'm thinking it has 16 because then, like, it's placed in different areas or, you know what I mean? So, like, it all floods into. Mm -hmm. it well, all... it's not like a grid system. It's like, it's literally the back segment, the next segment, the next bit. So, it's like just a bunch uh, of segments from front to back, oh, okay. if you will. Yeah. Interesting. We'll post a schematic of what those look like on our socials at Red Web Pod uh, in case you're still missing what I'm trying to describe. But. The Olympic and the Titanic's promotional material. And this is where I, I'm really happy we're diving into this detail because advertisement is a magical thing that rides the line of lie and truth. Yes, it does. And in Stretches this case, it. oh yeah. And I think in this case, it definitely did that, whether they meant to or not. And it definitely maintains that pseudo lie, I'll say that to this day, right? The unsinkable idea, because we know it sank. But Here's what the promotional material said, quote, As far as it is possible to do so, these two wonderful vessels are designed to be unsinkable. Of course, the traveler wants to hear unsinkable, but the company is saying, as far as it's possible to do so. Right, because at the end, like, they're still going to cover themselves. Mm -hmm. So all this is to say, many believed, of course, it must be fact, unsinkable, period, right? Though the White Star Line only ever described the ship in this way with heavy qualifiers. A lot of little asterisks, right? Of course. So with context, it's like, no, no, no. Any ship could sink, but we attempted to design this one so well that you could have strong peace of mind, confidence in the ship, right? So after picking up more passengers in France and Ireland, the Titanic set off for New York, crossing the Atlantic on April 11th. There were about 2,200 people in total on board the Titanic. Remember, you asked this, 2,400 is yeah. the capacity of the passengers, but when the ship left that day on the 11th, it had 1,317 passengers. So fully crewed. Picked up like... And a little more than half of its passenger capacity. Yeah, so picked up like 900 people, like 2,200 by the time it set sail. Like oh, it, 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 it like picked up some people along the way. Uh, 2,200 total, be, including the crew. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, sorry, yeah. I should have clarified. Oh, so good. a little around 900 ish, just shy of on the cruise side, 1317 for the passengers. So, okay. yeah, it was scheduled to arrive in New York on April 17th, a nice week journey across the Atlantic Ocean. And suddenly you're in a totally different place. Fancy for the time, right? Yep. Throughout the journey, the Titanic received radio communications that icebergs were prevalent in the area that they were sailing. On April 14th, the captain sent Titanic slightly south in order to avoid an area that was known to have the presence of icebergs. At 9.40 p.m., a nearby ship, the Mesaba, sent radio warnings of an ice field. The bridge of the Titanic never received this particular message because, at the time, wireless messages did not have a thorough priority system developed yet. For example, a master service gram which could be placed in front of the message with an MSG, because it's all like, why am I blanking on it? It's like, do 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 Oh, uh, Morse? Morse code, thank yeah, you. Yeah. So they would put MSG at the front of the thing to indicate that it's a master service gram, which would have required the captain to directly acknowledge having received the message. That's really the only prioritization oh, method they had at this okay. particular time. Yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, the warning from the Mesaba did not have such a label on it. Therefore, it was not immediately passed along to the captain, or at least not quickly enough for right, any action yeah. to have been taken. Why would you not? That I feel like that's just the the priority. Yeah. What's yeah. higher than that? Oh, did you, did you have a, an escaped convict on board? You, right. You write something random. Right. That seems very immediate, and I think this does feed into right. several of the conspiracy theories. But another thing that I found very interesting in this research from the team was that the wireless operators were thought to have used this system not only for messages like this, like I, I lived my whole 32 years up into this point going, oh, well, why else communicate to another ship unless you're going to convey, you know, pertinent information? Yeah. You know, icebergs in the area, we need help, or hey, smooth sailing, or you know, whatever, just business stuff. But it is said that, you know, wireless operators, again, were thought to have used the system for casual conversations as well. <laughs> I was just about to make a joke and, and then, you know, the occasional what's up. How's hey, it how's it going, dude? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm still like baffled that they didn't send that with the the urgency. I mean, that's just seems like the most dangerous thing. Yeah, I mean, or hindsight's like, 2020, like, doesn't it? Tide, high tide. I mean, they, yeah. I mean, I, that just feels like that's just a blanket statement. Like, hey, iceberg, anytime. I mean, a iceberg 
field. Yeah. Like, yeah. what else are you prioritizing? Exactly. That's what I'm saying is what yeah. else are you chatting about? Especially one letter at a time when you're beeping away. Just oh, to yeah, get, like, true. You it's like dot, dash, dot, yeah. dot, 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 beep, dash. Beep, boop, beep, beep, boop. Right. Yep. So the idea there is that perhaps these casual conversations could have bogged down Muddy the communication. The comms? I mean, also, you have to have an operator sitting there translating in what's coming in and then turning that into language. That takes some time. It takes time to say stuff, takes time to receive it. And so it could also be that these messages just got caught in the in the bog of like, okay, we had to receive these messages. And this, this is where I reference the movie because we are the movie podcast about mysteries. But the movie did a decent job at at least taking some of this. Of course, they fill in the gaps, but yeah. um, they at least did a decent job at illustrating this where the Titanic starts to get frustrated that the other ships are just kind of conversating. <laughs> and so they're like, they actually, so the way the movie did it, which is definitely not factual, right? but the way the movie handled it was like, this ship warned of the iceberg field. And then this is when they decided to go, guys, just F off, like stop talking to us. <laughs> yep. And then it cuts to the other ship and they're like, we warn them about icebergs and they tell us to go away. Like, so it's like a little like yeah. more dramatized, but like oh, for sure. that could have kind of been what was happening with all these with the this comms chatter. being muddied and everything. Yeah, because the, the the gents that were running it were like, it's they're insane. gonna keep us up all night translating just faff, just random I messages. Mean, technically, if you just take it at face value like that, that person, the person that sent it that didn't write priority, and the person that was mm -hmm. just not paying attention, kind of are responsible for everything oh yeah very <laughs> I mean, much like so. it's just right then and there it it kind of feels like a very unfortunate boy who cried wolf situation where yeah all the comms being just normal communicate like people talking and then suddenly within there is like a hey but seriously here's a good warning that you need to heed right. and then back to the chatter about hey what you wearing khakis you yeah. know like but anyway let, let, coming back to it there was a couple other wrinkles that led to the really unfortunate circumstance so Let's go to the crow's nest now, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. Very infamously shown in the movie. The crow's nest had very low visibility that night because the waters were extremely calm and, importantly, there was a lack of moonlight. Christian, I wonder if we can look up historically what phase the moon was in that night or if it was cloudy. Ooh, that's a good question. Because if it's like a new moon, that would be like, ooh, sucky. But to make matters worse, another wrinkle, they didn't even have binoculars. What? Yeah, so they couldn't even cast their vision out further to see what's going on. So you have two guys way up in the crow's nest, which is just like a little basket high up on a pole on yeah. the ship. And they don't have binoculars. Their visibility is basically gone. And so it wasn't until literally the very last minute when it's You're like right. imminent that they actually see it and bell it down. They ring the bell and call for it. But God, I feel like you kind of just stall the ship and just... Pull it around a bit because oh yeah like, well, what? Oh. we're almost there yeah we, we'll talk about what they did but so that's another thing that led to this taking us to 11:40 p.m. This is when an iceberg was spotted while the Titanic was about 400 nautical miles south of Newfoundland, Canada. First officer William Murdoch ordered that the ship turn left and then full reverse the engines. However there was not enough time to evade the iceberg and the Titanic's starboard or right side scraped against the iceberg, cutting open various parts of the ship. And it was determined after finding it in the depths and, and analyzing the wreckage that about five of the aforementioned compartments were ruptured. No, they can only handle four I know. No, if it only didn't fill that fifth one. Yep. And like, and I'll kind of riff more about my Titanic knowledge on that in a bit. But Christian, did you find the uh, the moon phases? I did. Skies were clear. The moon was in a waning crescent phase, mm -hmm. and only it had, had about nine percent of its surface illuminated. But the moon was not visible that night. Got but it. It sounds like there were stars in the sky, but obviously that doesn't provide the yeah. most illumination. Just looking up a waning crescent, it's like. Just like that little sliver, you know? Oh, like that's, when you're a kid and you draw the moon. Su super tiny. Yeah. I, I would say even thinner than that. When I was a Probably. kid, I drew them a little, drew them a little thicker. Oh, you oh you did thick? No, well, because you maybe do, you draw a face on it or I something. I did those like, like real haunting, thin crescents. Because oh. that stuff's so cool looking. God. Yeah. Well, maybe not haunting. I don't know. It was just <laughs> my bad art just made it look like a weird slice of pizza, but <laughs> don't laugh. I'm a kid. I was a kid. Still am. So the captain sent out a distress signal at that point. At this point, the passengers felt a rumble throughout the ship, but no one is is worried. No one knows that there's anything to be worried about. In fact, 
people were up on the deck kicking around some of the ice that had shown up on the top of the the deck like it some of it crashed onto the deck what? and there was just big chunks of ice people are playing with it a little bit people thought like oh that's that was weird anyway let's go about our business but yeah at this point the captain's like okay i i kind of know better sends out a distress signal but the only nearby ship the californian had its radio off for that night oh my god so there's so many things that lead to where this oh, ended up. Oh no! Right? Why did they have their That's radio? What are you? What is it like? Hmm? What was it? What is the point? What's the that? point of having it? Yeah. Was it off, or was the guy or whoever was running it just maybe sleeping, or like did they? I don't know. Ooh. I don't know. Maybe maybe the Californian was tired of all the the conversating. True. Know? So, among the two thousand two hundred and forty people aboard, only seven hundred and five people ended up escaping the sinking ship via the lifeboats, which, it is worth mentioning, has been classically pointed out that there were never enough lifeboats for everybody that was on board. Ridiculous. Nor were they properly filled to the capacity that the lifeboats could hold. I'm pulling numbers out of the air, right? So, like, don't quote me on this, but something between 50 and 60 people could fit on these lifeboats, and some of them would, would be set off with teens or 20-some-odd people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So did they were they just misinformed or were they panicking? It was a lot of panic. It was a lot of protect me and not thee. It was a it was a lot of just kerfuffle and it was just Jeez. poorly managed. Yes. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, feel I mean, free to the, not correct no, me on those, Christian. No, no. You you had it right. The the light they had so the Titanic had fourteen lifeboats on board yep. and their capacity was sixty five people. So okay. you were dead on. Okay. They had two emergency sea boats which could hold up to thirty five people. Okay. And then they had four collapsible boats which could hold up to forty nine people. Got so it. their total lifeboat capacity in factoring all those numbers was one thousand one hundred seventy six. So, so like 400 people died unnecessarily. So uh, way like more 700 than 700 went on the... 705 escaped the sinking ship via lifeboats. And of all of those types of boats there I, yeah. that you mentioned. Of the 2,240... So a third of, of the people on that ship made it out alive. Oh my God. Yeah. And to add insult to injury, not only was what Christian said, not enough lifeboats for the amount of just passengers... It's not even half of the passenger capacity. It's yeah. not even a third of the ship's total capacity. Right. It's woefully underprepared. And I think a lot of that came down to, again, a lot of these things feed the conspiracies, but some of it came down to, oh, well, we're confident in the ship. It doesn't look good to have all these other boats dangling around the edges. So let's get rid of some of them, was some of like what was floating around in the air. Oh, come but, on. Oh, yeah. That's not a good enough reason. Oh, yeah. So let's flash forward now. The ship, uh, well, actually, I'll just kind of riff more off my memory. Five compartments are scraped open at the front right side of the ship, letting water flood in. Obviously, people are bolting out of there as much as they can. The water locks are coming down to contain each of those compartments. But oh, unfortunately, people in the compartments, that's right. Oh, yeah. The yeah, people yeah. down way down in there, uh, the workers shoveling coal and keeping the engines going Jeez and stuff. Christ. So those people are all fleeing as much as they can. And these five compartments are all in a row and they're all on the front half. So what ends up happening is these compartments all do trap the water as they're in in intended to. Mm -hmm. And as you might recall from the film or if, if the task force, you might recall just from like pop culture in general or any imagery, the ship starts to tilt forward. The, the front sinks first. Obviously, that's where the water is. Yeah. This is what illuminates the issue of these particular containment walls is that because it listed forward, the water level from inside was able to breach over top of the next compartment wall. Oh. And so then it filled the sixth. And so it pulled the ship down further and it, then it yeah. went into the seventh. So it, it was able to flow over each wall uh, into the next compartment, taking the front of the ship further and further down until the back end of the ship was up in the air, snaps, falls down. Jesus, that's right. The front right. half goes oh. deep underwater and shoots off like a torpedo. A piece of it still connected, dragging the back end down before it finally disconnects, leaving the back half of the ship upright, bobbing in the air like a buoy, oh. which it then sank down as we see in the film. And then it went kind of straight down. And after many, many decades of just kind of trying to find this needle in the haystack, they found the wreckage, confirming it was in two halves. And man, is oh, it, wow. yeah, it it's really it's unfortunate yeah, it took to see. a while. Oh yeah, I had a whole like book on this thing when I was a kid, but I, I binged this movie many times. 
I don't know what struck me about it. It was just like... What a tragedy. It's such a tragedy combined with such an awe-inspiring feat of engineering. Yeah. And, and then the downfall of that thing. But yeah, it was also very, like, just a gorgeous ship on the inside. But anyway, I that was me going off the rails off memory. But yeah, that was one of the flaws with the, the compartments as they were. All right, so the ship is now sunk in that night. I, I believe around the 1 to 2 a.m. hour, it... it I think definitely by two. As in like when the ship was fully, fully underwater? Fully, fully, yeah, yeah, no fully more back, sunk. back half, mm -hmm. junk uh, in the trunk, floating, bobbing. Right. Looks like it was around 2.20 in the 220. morning. 220. Ooh. So that's a good piece to, to think about because this water is freezing. I mean, you're, you're very oh, yeah. unlikely to survive this water, at least straight up due to hypothermia and, you know, being frozen. So an hour and 10 minutes goes by. That's when they're finally picked up by the Carpathia, a ship that, I mean, the California was, the Californian was close. They could have been there before the ship was done sinking. Oh. So that's another thing to think about for the conspiracies. But the Carpathia was the second furthest away ship or the second closest ship. So mm -hmm. they come through at 3.30 is when they're able to get there. Anybody that's remaining alive or in these lifeboats, oh they take them on board. Yeah, and everyone's just dead, frozen. Yeah. Just, okay, this is, I'll, we'll leave this in. A little we should side, leave it in. A little sidebar, uh, kind of going back in time as the ship is sinking, um, because it is here kind of in my outline, the musicians that would play just normally for the entertainment of the guests, actually because they knew the ship was going down and they knew they weren't a priority, mm -hmm. um, as it was, it was women and children. And then if there was room after that, then it would be classes because oh. there's the different classes yeah. of who bought what ticket and, Disgusting. you know, oh, yeah. So, so wait, like, that was in the movie, so this really happened? Yeah, I, I have to say, I haven't seen the movie in a while, but I will say just from like the 10 minute clip I watched earlier today, I have to commend James Cameron on as much historical accuracy as he had at the time and, and, right. and putting that into the film. But yeah, the musicians played played them out to try wow. to keep morale going and to try to keep people from full panic. They kept yeah. playing. And oh, that's um, honorable. I yeah. mean, talk about Captain going down with the ship and you got musicians. Just Absolutely. Like, one last hoorah. Yeah. But yeah, so Carpathia comes through, picks everybody up at 3.30 a.m. and um, was able to take the survivors the remaining distance to New York where then whoever may or may not have been waiting for them probably had word by that point. Yeah, and then that, whatever was, delay that, that disaster been. struck. Yeah. Do we know how many they picked up? Uh, it would have been those 705 that survived, I imagine. Interestingly enough, though, and this is a fun fact I've always had, but I'm so eager to share it with you here and, and the task force. Interestingly enough, there are many experts that say if the captain had just taken the hit, right? Because they were going directly at right, this right. iceberg. If he just speared it? Yeah. So instead of trying to stop the engine's turn and letting it scrape down the side, well, not he didn't let it. He tried to dodge it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But some experts say that if he had just taken the full frontal hit and basically rear-ended this iceberg that the ship would have stayed seaworthy that that front compartment would have been the only thing damaged yeah the ship would have looked a little heinous yeah and really open Whoa. but maybe those front one or two compartments would have filled with water and, and then held it. it yeah yeah i don't know maybe it would have pulled it down a little bit but not enough to breach the next wall or whatever and create that domino effect but yeah, I've always found that deeply fascinating that and very interesting and almost like really upsetting to know, you know, like yeah. how, how it could have gone different when, where it's just, oh, man, yeah, for, for you to sit there and be like, I'm trying to make the right decision. And then the right decision all along was to just do nothing. Let it happen. God, I can't imagine, you know, so the Titanic's wreck, as you can imagine, with the Californian having its radio off while also being the closest ship. And also being able to be there while the, while the Titanic is still above water, right? The lack of urgency on the warnings, the lack of binoculars in the crow's nest. Uh, things like this are just, just enough for conspiracy theorists to fill in the gaps and say, okay, th there's enough unfortunate circumstance that should have been avoided, should, not just could, should have been avoided by proper protocol that it leaves a lot of room for theory, right? So... This wreck essentially led to intense media response, which flooded the world with this news, mm -hmm. which then led to a lot of legends and many conspiracy theories to arise from it all. Yeah, I mean, I can see that, right? There are certain things that just don't 
quite make sense that feel mm -hmm. like really obvious slip ups in hindsight. Yeah. Um, oh, the lifeboats. Yeah, that's another huge one. Not having enough. Well, but actually, just, that just seems malicious if that was actually consciously yeah. decided. But I'm very curious to see what what like the theories are. Mm hmm. Because in my mind right now, it seems like they're just grasping at everything, right? Yeah. Like well, the initial well, ship with the radio off not showing up. Yeah. I just feel like that's coincidence. I just feel yeah. like maybe picking yeah, and choosing. Unless, I mean, to, for, for a lot of these things to happen purposefully means that someone uh, that has a lot of power, yeah. that has a lot of connections, yes. put everything into play. Yeah. And I mean, we're going to get into it. I mean, some of these theories really, one of these is my favorite and okay. a couple other of these are... Some are well grounded and will be very interesting to hear your thoughts yeah, on. Yeah, I want to see those. And then some, I will say, uh, we're going to start with the more grounded ones and end with the uh, the less grounded ones. I'll just say that. Some more interesting theories that I actually hadn't heard of before. But what to you is standing out right now? It, it, like, what's your gut saying? Before I'll give I mean, like my, a small my, my gut is telling me that, like, you know, uh, it was just bad weather. Mm hmm. Um, well, good weather, yeah. but not for the sake of right, vis right. Visibility. Yeah, yeah. I guess it, yeah. So it was like it was good weather, but they weren't equipped with the binoculars, mm -hmm. and that was just a mistake. That just feels like a, I don't know. They just kind of accidentally glossed over that. The lifeboats. I can see someone higher up being like, "Look, we're marketing this as unsinkable. What are the odds?" Like we you cut said, corners as as a society all the time. Yeah. It's like, Look, we save money. It doesn't look like we're prepared for this thing to sink at all. It shows that, you know, we take out some life bulbs, we save money, it shows confidence. Sure. I'm, I see that as a pitch and people going, yeah. It is a maiden voyage. Are you really thinking that air quote unsinkable mm -hmm. Titanic is going to go down? And then like there's already confirmation, it seems like, with the comms just being muddied with random chatter. Right. And so at that point, I don't know. To, what did someone hire someone to like fill in that day for the comms and then just to rant away and not send them to send the message but not send it as priority yeah you know what i mean like yeah that that reaches for me it, and so i feel like it's a bunch of just unfortunate little things i think so i yeah. do i i would agree i mean just last week we talked about an amusement park that is of a similar time period and mm -hmm. so it's like, yeah, we, we think that we're much safer and smarter now, but really, like, there are probably glaring issues with our society now that in 100 years from now, we're going right. to go, why did they not have that rule for safety? Right? Exactly. So I'm sure that, you know, it's a product of its time, some unfortunate circumstances, and then and then it led to the... But again, I, I'd be very curious to hear. I'm going to give you a few smaller theories that are kind of more mainstream okay. before we dive into the whole kind of conspiracy section. I'll give you a little sampler platter before the little break we take. So one of the smaller theories is that the captain of the Titanic, Edward Smith, was attempting or was pressured to set a record for the fastest crossing of the Atlantic Ocean. There is no evidence of this, but it is something that has been said, right? Like it's their maiden voyage. It's this big, you know, wealthy white star line. What better than the maiden voyage than to break a record and get more tickets, right? True. But could they do it in a boat that big? I mean, yeah, this thing was cooking. Mm. And okay. I mean, that's all the more impressive. Like, it's giant, but it's fast? Wow. Yeah. Another theory, I hadn't actually heard of this one, so let me know what you think. Another theory is that a German U-boat actually hit the Titanic with a torpedo. The only wrinkle with that being that what? World War... What? Yeah. The only wrinkle, though, is that World War I hadn't started yet. Oh, and well, so the reason. There's no immediate kind of cause How for aggression there. How far off are we from World War I at this point? It's a good question. World War One started in 1914. Yeah. I will say, close enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Close enough. Another small theory, again, before we get into the, the biggies, the big boys, others have claimed that the shipbuilders may have inadvertently used inadequate equipment, such as the rivets that hold the hull together might not have been able to withstand the very frigid icy temperatures that they went in, creating very brittle metal. Oh. Yeah. And so then they would become more easily broken and penetrated by something I mean, like an iceberg. That's just what people do in general, right? In sure. construction, like a lot of construction, they cut corners where they can. Saves mm -hmm. time, saves money. And a lot of times it's like homeowner just won't ever notice it. Won't notice it. It won't ever come to fruition. Exactly. No. 
And so yeah. they're, they're just like, oh man, you know what? Let's just build this out. This thing ain't gonna hit anything. Don't have to worry about it. Oops. Yeah. Unfortunate. That that would be upsetting if it's like they just cut corners and went with what they had or cheaper material. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, hello there, Task Force. As always, every week, I get to talk directly to your eardrums about what's going on in Red Web. Today, we've already shouted out the live shopping event for the Sippy Cup of Knowledge coming March 9th. You'll be able to pre-order that during our live stream. We're going to pre-imbue those babies with a lot of knowledge and some Fredo facts, I guess. So that's happening. I'm very excited for that. Where can you watch it? At least at roosterteeth.com or the Rooster Teeth app. But go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel as well at Red Web Pod because if nothing else, we will at least upload the VOD, the video on demand, the stream archive of that whole shopping event. So you can check that out if you miss it by chance. No worries. And while I'm at it, redwebpod.com is another way to support the show. You get this podcast 24 hours early without the ad break. So if that's something you want to get into, you want to keep the vibes the entire time, keep those eerie feelings going, you can absolutely do that. And 100% of that goes to support this show and expanding the Red Web Task Force brand. You know, we got to build up the headquarters, tear it down, build it up, tear it down. We got a lot of things going on and we do have a coming you won't even get this reference yet because it's a future episode, but a basketball court absolutely on its way. It's a new sport that started here with two people at the headquarters. So get excited for that sport in a future episode. Otherwise, with that said, I want to talk about some fantastic sponsors. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. Thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Oh my God, I remember doing that and I hated it. Honey is a free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. When you shop online and head to checkout, the Honey button appears and all you have to do is click apply coupons. Honey searches for coupons for that site that you are shopping on and if it finds a working coupon, it will apply the best one and you just get to sit there and watch the price drop. I use Honey no matter where I'm shopping because Odds are it's going to find some sort of discount code, whether you're buying new clothes, you're buying some tech somewhere. A lot of storefronts have coupons. And I remember scouring scammy websites with a lot of different ads and clickable scamwares just to try to find coupon codes. And I really appreciate that Honey does all that laborious, tedious stuff for me. And Honey doesn't just work on desktops, oh no, no, it works on your iPhone as well. Just activate it on Safari on your phone to save on the go. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out on so much savings, and by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid as well as supporting this show. Get PayPal Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash redweb. Again, that's joinhoney.com slash redweb. This episode of Red Web is also sponsored by ExpressVPN. If you ever go online and use incognito mode, you should know that it's not as incognito as you might think. So how do you actually make yourself as invisible as possible online? Well, you can use ExpressVPN. When brokers buy and sell your data, one of those data points is your IP address, which can be used to uniquely identify you and your location. But with ExpressVPN, you get a random IP address shared by many other ExpressVPN customers, so it can't be delineated down to you specifically. Your connection gets rerouted through an encrypted server, so your IP address is masked. That makes it harder for third parties to identify you and harvest your valuable data. I use ExpressVPN when I'm downloading various things in case I'm browsing websites that I'm not sure about or that I don't frequent often, but I also just appreciate the extra layer of anonymity and security. It doesn't do anything to my speed. I can still download super fast. I can still browse at the speed that I expect, and it doesn't even hiccup in your games. If you're playing games online and you want to create an extra barrier of safety between you and other players, there's no way for them to try to figure out who you are or where you are. It's very nice, good peace of mind, and it doesn't interfere with the speed there either. So if you really want to have that incognito mode and you want to protect your privacy, secure yourself with the number one rated VPN. Visit expressvpn.com slash redweb and get three extra months for free. That's expressvpn.com slash redweb. One more time, expressvpn.com slash redweb. And with that said, let's dive right back into the conspiracy. All right, so let's dive into the first theory. This one is, this one, oh man, I was going to say that, I don't, no pun intended, this one holds water. 
to me. <laughs> <laughs> this one holds water. Um, <laughs> some theorize that the Titanic didn't sink because of the iceberg in particular, that it might have been part of it, but not the cause, but because of a fire that started on the ship. There was a coal fire that had been burning in the hull for as early as three weeks before the ship's maiden voyage, but the crew was not able to put it out. I have an image that I'm going to show you, and Task Force, you can check that out on our socials as always, um, but I'm going to show you that in a second. I mean, so regardless of being the cause, this actually happened? This happened, yes. No. Oh. Yeah. So we have researcher and engineer Robert Essenhigh, who wrote in 2007 that the high speed at which the ship was going could not be explained by theories of a race across the Atlantic. They didn't think that that was a substantial enough reason for its speed, but rather, because, well, because there's no evidence of that. Right. But rather that it must have been the crew instead shoveling a lot of coal into the furnaces, which feed the engine, right? In order to stop the fire. This fire's going on and on and on. Let me say this, coal is extremely flammable. And right. I think, I don't remember where exactly, I want to say somewhere in the Smoky Mountains, if you mind helping me out, Christian, there is a an old coal town that has this huge coal mine under the city, under the town, and it caught fire and it is literally impossible to put out because it's like so full of coal and it's per like permeating under the surface. They were unable to put it out and I think it's still raging to this day underground. And so the, the town just wow. got abandoned. Because it just has an abundance of coal? Yeah. Oh, that, so why would you that, build a town over that? I don't know. It well, you, you want that money, short-sighted. That or it burned for years and then I don't know, but like eventually, it, like it's it still out. just like hot. I don't know. I, I heard about that long time ago. But so, so that's so, what's happening in the hull so of the ship. Piles of coal. So explain to me yeah, why. Yeah. Okay, so there's a fire. Where mm -hmm. is this fire happening? So in the very bottoms of the ship. Here, okay. let me show you the photo now. And why why is it that them feeding? Oh, is that supposed to be like a burn mark? That is a burn mark, and, and I'll talk more about that here in a second. Interesting. But, but that's kind of the location of the ship. So where so, this is, task force. It happens to be on the bottom right front of the ship, right where the nose, the nose cone kind of starts to level out and become parallel and mm -hmm. go down the straight side of the ship. Yep. It's around that kind of bend, almost exactly where, unfortunately, the iceberg struck. And that you can kind of see where I'm going, but. Ah, oh, I yeah. weakened it. So yeah, wait, what were we going to ask? Sorry. There was a fire and they need to keep feeding coal. Okay, so so they to had keep the fire at bay? Right. So the the fire's feeding off this coal. Right. They're shoveling the fuel which is coal into the furnace to get it away from the fire which is just out and about. Oh. Right. Christian, feel free to like expand on this cuz I don't remember if the fire stopped before the maiden voyage or if it actually as this guy's saying continued into the voyage and in order so for it to not consume their fuel outside of the furnace they're like screw it get it in there while it's good before so they the just, do over. they just have this mountain of coal mm -hmm. at the bottom of the ship mm -hmm. it caught fire it's burning a little bit chipping away at the side of the hole and they're just like you know what let's just shovel it all in and use it i believe there are multiple piles of coal in the bottom okay. for all of the different furnaces there are Four stacks, so I imagine four big furnaces or something like that. Maybe that like, is like deep information that I just, it's just, I don't know. It's stuff like that that yeah. kind of just makes you go, uh, I have a whole kind of new look or revived look at this mm -hmm. thing that I knew a handful about. Yeah. So that's my take on this, right? I might be missing some gaps, but, but again, it is a conspiracy theory. Yeah. But it based on some real facts right uh, it, it addresses the speed it addresses the not really wanting to turn off course to avoid icebergy areas and it addresses maybe why this iceberg was able to penetrate such a well well-renowned thick hull that yeah. they thought would be impervious huh and just to confirm yeah you guys are, are nailing it the the coal fire was in the hole and had been burning for days before the ship left wow but they couldn't afford to delay yeah, leaving. So the the ship left while the fire was still burning, and yet, yeah, really, that is way. irresponsible, and that's insane. Oh yeah, uh, and that that's the kind of stuff that I'm sure majority of the people, everyone knows about the Titanic. Uh huh. I'm sure majority of people didn't know there was a fire burning. That's why I'm so days stoked before. to be covering this, dude. Like I'm that so photo. Stoked. That photo is interesting. I'd never seen that photo before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, to see they, that burn there area. Documented evidence. Yeah, that this was something that was being dealt with. Mm -hmm. and yeah, the only way to really deal with the fire in that scenario is to just shovel it into the furnaces. Because like you were saying, yeah, coal just burns. And mm -hmm. the, the disaster you were talking about, I looked it up. It was in Pennsylvania in Centralia, Centralia, forgive the pronunciation, 
but it was a fire that started in uh, abandoned coal mines underneath this town in Pennsylvania that's been burning since 1962. Yeah, it's get still that. going. Get Whoa. that? Yeah. Okay, so not maybe the Smokies, but you know, uh, oh east east coastish. I mean, yeah, like, man. look, I knew coal is flammable. That's why we use mm -hmm. it for yeah. a number of things. Of course. The fact that it just kind of just keeps a flame going. Yeah. That's marvelous. Yeah, I mean. I guess what that does, like everyone goes, well, no, duh, it burns. But like, I, what no, I'm trying to, to convey going. is like, the this level has been going for decades, how long? Decades, decades, sixty-one years. Like that's what I'm talking about. And so that's what's I happening in a much smaller way cool. in this ship, right? It's wild stuff. That that's cool. The, all that's that's just, oh yeah, man. That, this the is why stuff, I really want to. stuff. That's mm -hmm. and the fact is the beautiful thing, yeah. task force. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That this is fact. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and and, and a podcast where we have just a lot of theories and questions like this is very interesting fact yeah. this itself could be like a theory and just hearsay that backs it up but no that's oh, okay mm -hmm. dang, dang, dang i got dang. A, i got a minor wrinkle for this okay, uh, yeah. i'll be curious how you feel about it but but yeah this this really happened um, i'm assuming the wrinkle though it it attacks the pole being weak no 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 i think that that's part of the, the yeah that's part of the theory so uh, to, to build on that, it was theorized that the ship's integrity may have been weakened by this fire raging away for those days and weeks prior to the, the ship leaving. So when it hit the iceberg, the damage was worse than maybe it could have been. Journalist Senan Maloney also pointed out photos, like I showed you, in which black lines were around 30 feet or about three meters long that could be seen along the ship's hull that were there before the Titanic even left where it was built. I mean, before it left the bay where it was put together, man. This thing was destined for a bad time. Jeez. I mean, if I was to get on the ship, though, and I saw it from that side, I'd be like, what's that? What's that? <laughs> oh, just some weird paint. You know what? That would be the answer. I mean, you're I was not like, going to look I at was that like, and be what like, what would you say uh, to convince me that weird paint? Yeah. Shadowing? I don't know. Yeah. But here's the thing, and I mean, this you I could give you the honest answer because here's the reality. Coal fires were very common on ships around this time. So usually they were not a cause for concern. I say usually. We it's it's still totally possible that it did play a part in this very long series of unfortunate circumstance. But is it a reason to kind uh, of turn away from it? I don't know. Okay, so here's the thing. If that's something that's common, mm -hmm. then it's not as nefarious as I'm thinking. Oh, you brought it back. I love that word. You know, it's been a while. Yeah. Yeah, so I took we it out of the chest again. <laughs> just just yeah, a pin that says nefarious. nefarious. Yeah. Oh, weird. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because I thought it was like, it burned, and that's just something that doesn't usually happen, and they just neglected it. But yeah. But if this is something that's, it seems like it does happen from time to time, nothing mm -hmm. to be alarmed, then I can kind of see why they're just like, all right, let's just keep it going. Yeah. Huh. So I'm going to let you have a glimpse at one of the later conspiracies I'm going to talk about just because I want to get your uh, reaction to this word. What? Yep. So we'll, how? Get, so how? Yeah, we'll, we'll get there. Okay, we'll get there. <laughs> but I don't know how you're going to get me there. I'm going to keep you on, on <laughs> ground level. I'm going to keep you here at the bottom of the rocket before we launch you to the stratosphere for that one. Uh, Task force. Yeah. Okay, I, can, I, I think I know. I'm not going to say it yet. I think I know where it's going to try and reach to. Uh -huh. But let me tell you, you're n take a guess. Guess now, yeah. Guess now. You're, Ri you're write wrong. it down. You're wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> you are wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> Definitely. You're okay. Uh, here's the next one. And, and if you guess this one, Task Force, which many of you probably will, you will be right. Because this is my favorite, albeit uh, uh, it starts to hit stretch territory, but it's, mm -hmm. it's definitely grounded. And I love this theory. Here it is. A very popular conspiracy theory about the Titanic is that the sister ship, the Olympic, was actually the ship that sank. Stop me if I get confusing because there's going to be a lot of name swapping here. But the theory says that the Titanic and the Olympic were swapped and that the Olympic was renamed the Titanic and then sent off. And that's the ship that sank. Have you ever heard of that before? No. Oh, then we're going to have a good time. Let's talk about it. So. What? When the Titanic was created, it was created along the two other ships that I talked about, right? You have the Britannic and the Olympic. The White Star Line wanted to create bigger, more luxurious ships, so they commissioned the Olympic class, which is the three that I mentioned. You have the Titanic and the Olympic, again, near identical ships built right next to each other. But there are a few very subtle differences, and that's where I have 
podcast where I have some uh, the notes, some files for you to take a look at. I'll, I'll set these in front of you upside down for Uh-oh. a second. The Olympic was the first of three ships to be built and went on its maiden voyage on June 14th, 1911. So it's been out there for almost a full year prior to the Titanic's maiden voyage. On September 20th, 1911, on the Olympic's fifth voyage, it crashed into the Hawk, a British warship. There was extensive damage to both ships and the White Star Line was found liable for the damages. So insurance did not cover anything and the company had to pay out of pocket for the repairs for not only the Olympic, but also the Hawk. So they're paying for repairs extensively on two ships. I just hit like a battleship. Yeah, well, I'll tell you how. Uh, this co- company is hitting everything on the damn ocean. <laughs> Let me just, can we just put that out there? I mean, like, like Jesus, invest wrong. in better sonar, radar? I don't know. Like, I don't know if sonar was a thing during that time. That's a good question. It yeah. was not. It was, no, not. It was not, right? Yeah, yeah. Somebody radar. already pinged that in their mind when you mentioned it before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But damn, like two for two? Yeah. Okay. So it didn't sink, okay? It's still going. Right, but you're still hitting it, everything in the oh, damn yeah. ocean. It's, it's hitting other ships, hitting icebergs. This is a this is a a, a driver's permit on display. Yeah. You know, 15 year old just got a hold of dad's uh, old Buey and uh just just banging yeah, it up. Yep. So repairs on the Olympic actually delayed the maiden voyage of the Titanic, and some pieces of the Titanic were actually used in the repairs. So they were cannibalizing some of the construction of the Titanic to get the Olympic back up to snuff, and that then delayed the Titanic's launch. Now, the cause of the crash was determined to be, interestingly enough, suction from the Olympic having pulled the Hawk ship into it. So suction being like when you're displacing all that water, it has to collapse back in behind you. And if you've ever seen a small boat go too close to a big boat, there is suction that pulls you in mm-hmm. and also creates like a negative pressure that you can actually end up sinking. I've seen like a, a viral video of a jet skier going by a cargo ship, very dangerous to do. And he started like collapsing, like the, it started sinking yeah. and stuff. So that's essentially what happened here. They passed too close together and the water interference kind of pulled- The ship pulled, together. Mm-hmm, pulled them together and then they hit. Some believe, now this is where the conspiracy starts to kick off. Some believe that the Olympic was considered too damaged to be profitable anymore and it was then switched with the Titanic by the International Mercantile Marine Company, which I believe is the owner of the White Star Line. So uh, the yeah, company up. Yeah. In other words, the Titanic never sank. It was the Olympic that sank. We'll get into the motivations a little bit more here in a sec, but lots more deets to go through. So after the Titanic sank, the White Star Line received a million pounds in insurance money. I'm laying the case for potential motivation. Yep. Yeah. In today's currency, over a hundred years later, that would be just north of 87 million pounds or just north of 107 million dollars US currency. Damn. And I mean, inflation on a scale like that is, is, it's really hard to comprehend. Yeah. Suffice to say, Boku bucks. So some believe that the White Star Line intended for the air quote Titanic to incur some type of damage in order to recoup the cost of the Olympics repairs since the Titanic had a better insurance policy. Though it wasn't necessarily about sinking the ship, it was was about- more so let's get into an accident so we could recoup some of the insurance money to help cover the loss because this time around we have better premium insurance. Yes. Exactly. You, oh. you got a fender bender, you paid out of pocket. So you said, let me go get another fender bender, but do it in a way that will make insurance come pay for it and pay enough that we can maybe get that money back that we invested in the first I was bump. very curious how this was going to tie together yeah. and if it was going to tie together neatly. And it actually does. Mm-hmm. So again, it's not about purposely sinking it. Right. It's, it's about bang it up, just banging it up like, a little bit. I mean, good luck just trying to... Yeah, I'm gonna, bang up the ship just a little bit oh Mm -hmm. too much like how do you you know what i mean no one's trained for that right and so this doesn't really to me do do you think they're like we got to get it banged up take their binoculars right like hey california don't talk to them like i don't know like yeah there's other little pieces to it that are are missing really yeah like tie in there's a lot more here though that that i find interesting but there are wrinkles starting to form and i love being honest about those wrinkles So according to the theory, as I kind of reiterated already, the brand new Titanic ship went on then as the Olympic. 
Again, the name is swapped. So the Olympic has a new future with the renamed brand new Titanic. And, and that it. had a life of its own after this whole incident. Right, but the Titanic was the former former Olympic yes. that was repaired. Correct. Got it. Hmm. Yeah. Now, another piece of evidence for this theory is the number of portholes on each ship. If you know anything about the conspiracy of the, of the Titanic, the portholes is like, control F, find the word portholes, and it's like one of the most referenced oh. <laughs> things at this point. This is my favorite part about this whole thing is that, you know, internet mysteries are our bread and butter. Yes. This is where the internet got into play with the Titanic. Oh. Yeah. Like because way after. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because the detail about the portholes, <laughs> which are basically the little round windows on the side of the boat. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this, this theory or this detail was actually made popular by Reddit user Braze Mac. I believe it's pronounced that way. Braze Mac, if not. But um, anyway, this is what they had to say. And this is where feel free to flip over your evidence right now. So it says, this is an image of the RMS Titanic being built. I'll let you, that's the first image. Yeah, there you go. There's the Titanic. Just being, being built. Being built. And there's the Titanic. Uh, well, I'll describe the second one. Okay. I'll describe them all in order. But Task Force, I don't want to leave you out in, you know, in the cold. We're going to post all these photos in our socials. We'll put it on our YouTube video version of all this. So yeah, don't, don't sweat it. But you want to describe what you're seeing there? Yeah, it's just the Titanic. Um, it's the front mm -hmm. left side, probably like a third of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, just as I says Titanic and uh, it's kind of hoisted in the air being, yeah, it's being still being built. Finished. So you, it's what you think it's being hoisted up. There's uh, I guess there's people working on it. Yeah. And yeah. And so I'll continue uh, with the Reddit post. It says, quote, look at the topmost portholes in the railing on the Titanic. Count them too. look at the last five portholes and see that they are evenly spaced apart. But basically what he's saying is in the back end of this photo, there are some portholes here that are evenly spaced apart, right? You see that the gaps between them are even. Yeah. Boom. Some of them are a little closer than others. Some are a little further. Yeah, but these for the most part. are even. I mean, these guys right here. Yeah. This is where this second photo comes into play. So I'm trying to give a very verbal description of what we're seeing for the, oh. for the audio listeners. The second photo is a photo of a boat that's um, just floating along the dock. And if what appears to be the same portholes are in pairs. Ooh, you got in there. So here's what, yeah, this is what the user had to say. This is a picture of the Titanic before leaving on its maiden voyage. Check out the very same portholes in question. So what you've identified is the ones that have, and these are very hard to identify. When we post them on our socials, we'll put a little red circle around it to really hone you guys in on what we're talking about. But these portholes now look different, yet it's still also the Titanic. So continuing on now, there's a third image on the next page. Yeah, there'd be no reason for them to redo that. Correct. Well, potentially, right? Yeah. They continue to say this. Here is the Olympic in New York after the sinking of the Titanic. And what do you see there with those very same portholes? Lines up nicely. Are they even? Mm -hmm. Evenly spaced? Yes, they are. That is what they are saying here, right? Braze Mac goes on to say that it would be strange for the shipbuilders to suddenly change these windows of the Titanic last minute from evenly spaced to kind of more paired up. Also, what would be like the technical reason behind that? I, I don't know. So right. that that's where they're coming to the table and saying, mm, they this is proof that they swapped the ships because the Olympic was the one that had them paired up and the Titanic had them evenly spaced. But now the Titanic as it's leaving has them paired up and the Olympic after all this went down has them evenly spaced. How is this not real? Back then there are some wrinkles okay. there's some wrinkles you know and, and you were kind of on that money this wrinkle goes the first wrinkle goes a little further back it would have been hard to guarantee that the ship would have been damaged in a specific type of way let alone a way that would True. that would sink it it's it would be very hard to orchestrate a potential or purposeful damaging of the ship in fact i probably would have thought just nose the the iceberg and and go whoops and then stay afloat right yeah so that's but that's one of the theoretical wrinkles here, the backbone to this theory. Another one that really, actually, there's another image that I threw in there because I'm building yeah. on this case before I get to the next wrinkle. Go, go, ahead and, go ahead and jump to it. So these are, they're still called portholes, but they're just windows. They're rectangular and square windows on deck C. And what you'll notice is... It's a side-by-side -side 
on yeah, the yeah. top half of the Olympic and Titanic. Mm -hmm. The Olympic has windows that are unevenly spaced. Like kind of skinny, narrow. Like, they're like narrow, unevenly spaced windows on yeah. the side. The Titanic has noticeably larger windows. I mean, just eyeing it, yes. I would say double the size that are yeah. evenly spaced. I mean, and these are a ton of windows. And then at the bottom is a picture of the Titanic that has been sunk. And the windows are, yeah, they're kind of like... You tell me which they match with, because this they, could either help prove the theory, or it could be a wrinkle. I, I have what I think. No. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was looking at the top, top. It's not the top. It's below that. I mean, they are thinner. Oh, wait. Hold on. Let me see. Dang. So, Whoa. yeah, basically this is another, some people conflate the two different styles of portholes, the, these rectangular ones and then the round ones. So this is another piece of that theory that says, okay, the Olympic has very narrow, unevenly spaced windows. The Titanic has bigger, more evenly spaced windows. And when you look at the Titanic on the bottom of the ocean, it has what looks like the windows of the Olympic, those narrow, it unevenly does. spaced. This the, is insane. It, it is. I, this is what I thought was so interesting. And... There are other details to kind of uncover if you want to go even further down this particular rabbit hole, but these are the things that I found to be the most substantial for this particular conspiracy. But the wrinkle for this, and this is actually news to me, the wrinkle for this particular theory, despite the portholes being photographically in front of you, is that the Titanic and the Olympic both had different hull numbers, like serial numbers of a car. Okay. 401 for the Titanic and 400 for the Olympic. It wasn't well known at the time, like when these were being built and in an operation, but in retrospect, historically, these were kind of the code used for, for these things. And when pieces were recovered from the wreckage of what is said to be the Titanic at the bottom of the ocean, the number of the hull was 401. That of the Titanic. That of the Titanic. But, I mean, who's to say you don't just... I mean, like... Look, they're building and constructing the thing, right? Same big money got in there and said, hold on, don't tell them. Well, I mean, like the same thing with your VIN number, right? You can't take out your VIN number, but if you're a company that's building and constructing, like before you put in the glass, just unscrew the VIN plate and put in the other VIN plate. Yeah, see, th this is, I'm curious, Christian, because like, like, like I it said. It depends on like what actually is the serial number. Like right, how is it displayed? Right. That's a good point. And like I said, this is news to me. So I'm curious, Christian, do you have any other details around this number? Like, was it seen engraved in the hull? So was it like a, like a car does have serial numbers all over it? Or was it like a type of something was used that was only on 401, but not 400? I will have to do some digging because that's that a, not yeah. something that we looked at for the outline. No worries. Yeah, that, that That's a deep, deep dive. Yeah. Well, no worries on that. I'll let you kind of look into that and see if what you can find while we start to jump into some of the other conspiracy theories. But... This has been one of my favorite conspiracy theories of all time, honestly. This the is Olymp a good one. Yeah. Like, the Olympic I'm sure people don't know about this. Yeah. This is I'm so Whoa. deeply fascinated with it, honestly. The the swapping of the Olympic and the Titanic is so interesting to me. And eventually the Olympic went on to have a pretty successful career before, you know, and it went on many voyages, was around for many years. I think eventually it was converted into a warship of some kind. Well, I mean, yeah, the Olympic would be the newly built Titanic at that point, right? Yeah, right, uh, to this to this theory. And eventually, uh, w instead of retiring it and sinking it like some boats get done, they, they dismantled it and sold it out for parts, which is really unfortunate because... Wait, that's what they do? They well, just, for this one, they did. I don't know how they handled it. No, boats. but for boats, they just, re go, uh, they just retire it and just sink the thing? Sorry, I don't want to speak with authority, but I do know some boats have had that happen. I don't know if that's common. Oh, okay. I'll be honest. I don't know if that's common. I hope not. Right. I was like, Here, here's a new what? reef. Let's just sink this. And exactly. Have fish but the other thing I think, and I'm, this is deep in my memory, so I could be wrong. And Christian's already looking at something. So the Britannica, I also, because as a kid, I was desperate to be on board one of these boats. The two insides of these, like the grand staircase and everything is very, very similar. The Britannica has a totally different paint job, a little bit different looking, but otherwise the same. And so I was like, oh, cool. Maybe that one's still around. Like the Queen Mary. It's just an old boat yeah. that hangs out. Can I go to it? No, I believe the Britannica also sank. Okay. So the one that survived got pulled apart. So I don't know. Let me just pose the hypothetical out to the task force. Does that add to this theory? The obfuscation of like, well, you don't have a ship to compare it to because it was dismantled and sold off and the other ship is at the bottom of the ocean. So like, does that add to the theory, the intrigue here or... Or is there no kind of substance behind this theory? I, I don't know. Yeah. Like, either way, I would not want to sail under this company. 
No? Nah, I'm okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I'll pass. Their win rate's not that great. No, no, actually, no, not at all. <laughs> yeah. That's the coolest damn theory. It's so cool. And that, that's why I wanted to print out all these images so you can like really get hands on, make oh, it a little I love experiment. It. It was super tangible. It's like one of those labs when you're in sixth grade, they're like, whoa, I get to like touch this stuff. Yeah, oh yeah. All right. So let's talk about the next theory or conspiracy if you prefer. This one is that the Titanic was deliberately sunk to eliminate those that opposed the creation of the Federal Reserve Bank in the United States. I'm going to go ahead and say this at the very top. There's a Reuters article that deeply and quickly tries to debunk this with a lot of fact. So we're only addressing it because it's it's talked about a lot. Okay. But if you start looking at this on your own, we found out literally just today, as of the day of the recording of this, mm -hmm. there's a lot of real tinfoil hat deep state conspiracy stuff that comes along with this. So uh, just be mindful okay. if you look at it. We're yeah. not going to go that deep. We're just going to stay on the surface okay. and, and treat it like a face value theory. Right. All right. So... This conspiracy continues to say that among the many wealthy passengers on board were Benjamin Guggenheim, Isidore Strauss, and John Jacob Astor IV. These men were also some of the wealthiest people at the time who reportedly did not agree with the reserve. And it was a contentious idea in general, the creation of mm. the Federal Reserve. What was that, Andrew Jackson? I don't know, but I, I'm not going to go into all that. So that's what this conspiracy is kind of centering itself on. Take is, them out. Well, it was like, let's not do fractional reserve banking. Let's like, yeah. you know, not have a central bank like that, but whatever. I'm not a financial person, so I don't know enough to speak on that. But that's that's kind of what this is about. It was a very divisive topic at the okay. time. Yeah. So unfortunately, all three of them passed away in the disaster of the Titanic here. That's where John Piermont Morgan a.k.a. J.P. Morgan, oh. mm -hmm. the investment baker in the namesake of the company, now known as J.P. Morgan Chase, helped create the reserve, enters the fray. Now, with regards to this conspiracy, he helped create the reserve, the Federal Reserve. And so that's where this theory is coming from. Morgan had booked a private special suite on the Titanic, but at the last minute, as the conspiracy goes, decided to cancel and stay in France to lengthen his trip. I'm going to put my, like, hang a little post-it note on that for a okay. second. It's theorized that Morgan orchestrated or was aware in some sense of a plan to sink the Titanic since he did not go, since he did not decide to go on the ship, like many others. Further, Morgan was part owner of the Titanic, as he owned the International Mercantile Marine Company, the one we talked about earlier, the very company that owns the White Star Line. Oh. However, it would be impossible to guarantee that yeah. the three influential men that he would have, in theory, would have been up against for the reserve would have died. You can't confirm or deny that, right? Right. Or plan for that to happen, definitely. And the other wrinkle is, too, like Reuters deeply investigates this, and that's where I want to kind of discuss this wrinkle. J.P. Morgan was staying in France more because France changed their laws with regards to exporting the arts, and so it is said that Did JP Morgan. have a bunch of purchases? Yes. Okay. That he stayed in Paris to preside over the decision making and the handling of the arts he was actually attempting to export mm -hmm. back to his home over in the United States or wherever. That is as much as we can get into the history of it all. They also confirmed that while they don't know the nature of his cancellation on the Titanic, beyond that, it certainly wasn't, as the conspiracy says, last minute. But beyond that, it's uh, it's interesting. It's interesting. I mean, true, because there'd probably be some type of paper trail with that, right? Mm -hmm. And then in that sense, it's like, okay, now you're really reaching deep of like, yeah. okay, so did he buy art as an excuse? Because then he knew that, that mm -hmm. he would have issues and that would be his alibi. Like, now you're tumbling, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's interesting, right? You have two, in a sense, political opponents and some go down with the ship and one happens to dodge the ship. And so you start to go, wait a minute. Makes for a nice wait. story. Right, right. So that's where that conspiracy comes. I think it's interesting for sure. It attempts to answer some stuff. And it also, I mean, JP Morgan comes in with the Olympic, right? Because if he knew that the ships were swapped because he owned the companies, is that another reason why he dodged the ship? Because he was financially mm. liable for things. There are There's stuff like that floating around with JP Morgan. I think a lot of people are just interested in why he didn't go on the Titanic. Yeah. And I think that... And I'm trying to link it all together. Yeah, the boring answer about France and, and art law is, right. is sounds a little bit more stable of a reason. But I agree. But Christian, what you got? 
So, slight correction on what we were talking about. It's not the whole number that was the 400 and 401. Oh, okay. It was actually the yard number. Yard number. And a yard number is the number that the shipyard assigns to the ship as it's completed, typically in order of oh. completion. So, for example... Like where it's housed, essentially? Well, no, like as it goes out, since the Olympic was first, they're like, this one's 400. And then the next ship finished in that bay would obviously get the next one up 401 right. yeah and i so, imagine yeah. some other imagine some other ship after that is 402 exactly yeah olympic oh, was the okay. 400th ship made in this shipyard got the it. titanic was the 401st ship got it but the yard numbers kind of vary on where they're placed on the ships and they can be found on the whole so i think that's where oh, so it's the just misunderstanding a, might have been on our end i think it's like a, just a nomenclature thing it's called a it's a hull number because it's just a number on the hull there is a whole number there's separate oh, God. Terms, yeah. okay, okay sorry <laughs> go ahead go ahead yeah the Whole number is a different thing that I didn't admittedly didn't look into, but I think it's a, kind of what we were talking about, like a serial number, mm -hmm. whereas the yard number is kind of the identifier and they can put it on a ship. And I think in this case, the yard number was put on the holes of the ships. So, um, but uh -oh. is it just painted on? I have a wrinkle for the wrinkle. Were they swapped? Can they be swapped? Yeah, I mean, at uh, that is it point, like a placard or is it paint yeah. or from what I'm reading? It's a number that is etched into or impressed into the hole into some type of like metal plating okay but i as to like what exactly i'm not entirely sure yeah yeah i mean easier to change than paint i mean harder sure. to change than paint sure sure you could sand it paint it re-engrave it i mean as, as a What's child who though? dated his assignments wrong all the time it's really easy to turn a one into a zero <laughs> not so much to turn a zero into anything else but an eight true you know? yeah that's interesting. I don't yeah. know if we've ever had a wrinkle on the wrinkle. Oh, no. Okay. Oh, man. Now I'm back in. Yeah. Now I'm actually like mentally subscribed to that idea. Yeah. Oh, God. And and then what about? The, OK, so the fire. But what about the fire? Because the fire wasn't on the Olympic. It was definitely on the Titanic. Or was that? Oh, could, could the story oh, have damn. been changed? Or oh, it could be changed by then. God. though. It could have been changed by then. And then also, Here we or, go. or was it fire or was it like? patched damage and that's oh. why it looked oh no i'm tumbling i'm tumbling somebody get my tinfoil pull this man out i gotta get, I gotta get pulled out uh i'm jacked in too deep okay well damn geez. oh man that that that's a really good theory yeah 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 okay well that brought me back in but yeah so that that was uh the deliberately sunk angle the insurance claim monetary but also the federal reserve piece fascinating way less i think grounded than some of the other ones have been. Yeah. Speaking about not being grounded anymore, mm -hmm. Task Force, I hope you've got your... Guesses ready. I hope you've got your gas mask and your space helmet on. Cause Cause we're in the, <laughs> we are in the upper stratosphere. Because your guesses are going to be wrong. <laughs> I, I love this one because it sounds more outlandish than it kind of is. I don't know. Here it is. Get your guesses out. I don't, don't lie. Let's see it. Let's, you know, let us know what your... Mummy. What in the... <laughs> Bleep that! <laughs> but are, it, how? How are you going to even like what? Okay, just by saying it, I dug the what, deepest hole. There was a mummy on board. Like Emotet, it, it, dude. it was a. They were transporting a mummy to it from one museum to another, one archaeologist to another archaeologist, and it there, there was a curse with the mummy that traveled along with it. <sighs> Let's just get into it. Okay, you know. <laughs> I do love that there's a particular name name dropped in this this conspiracy that we've managed to not say thus far, and she's very commonly talked about with the Titanic. I wonder if you've heard this name when I get there, but let's start from the top, Trevor. Soon after the sinking of the Titanic, an article came out in the Washington Post suggesting that a mummy's curse could have caused the ship's demise. British editor William Stead was a passenger on the Titanic who subscribed to early 20th century spiritualism. Stead believed that a cursed mummy was wreaking havoc in London. This mummy was known as the, quote, unlucky mummy, because after the mummy was found at the Egyptian city of Thebes, it was thought to cause death, injury, and large-scale disasters. I think this has a lot to do with preconceived notion of ancient cultures. Yeah. But it didn't stop people from seeing and feeling things once this mummy was uncovered. This mummy was thought to have been a priestess of the College of Amun-Ra, while aboard the ship, Stead would tell other passengers about this evil mummy. In fact, one of the survivors of the ship went to tell the press about Stead's story of the cursed mummy after making landfall and, you know, in the whole fallout of the uh, incident. 
uh, this survivor had heard about this, and this is how we know about it today. There was another survivor, actually, Margaret Brown, a.k.a. the unsinkable Molly Brown, as played by the lovely Kathy Bates mm-hmm. in the movie Titanic, a real person, too, was traveling, actually, with Egyptian artifacts on the Titanic in order to deliver those to a museum in Denver, Colorado. Oh. Yeah. Some people believe that the mummy may have been among those artifacts and that she potentially brought that bad luck aboard the Titanic. Others have also speculated that the mummy could have been aboard the ship because the British Museum had sold it to an American who was shipping it home. Hopefully not for a personal collection, but rather right. some sort of a museum, museum of course. No, no just, yeah, this is my mummy room. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> okay. It's just like a suburban neighborhood, you know, <laughs> regular home carpet but there's a mummy in there right but here's here's the thing the, as, as with all theories we like to discuss the wrinkles it's not confirmed whether or not the mummy itself was actually aboard the ship and has not yet been figured out with exploring the wreckage nor i don't know if it's possible to at this point the mummy itself would definitely have long since come to decay and be spread into the water but whatever was containing it maybe could stick around but it has been found is what i'm saying oh really yeah so We basically can't confirm nor deny the mummy's presence, but we do know that Margaret Brown did, in fact, have Egyptian artifacts somewhere on the uh, ship. So, what do you think? Did we Uh, we claw our way out of that hole a little bit? or Coincidence. Yeah. There's just some artifacts, and then uh, the ship just so happened to sink. Yeah. But you showed me mummy, and I would would never have thought. Oh, yeah. That would look what? Jillian had that down as the uh, the second theory, and I was like, maybe I'll... Yeah, we'll hold well, that first one. Of all, first of all, I'm biased. I want to jump to the Olympics. Second of all, maybe we let some of these, uh, kind of, <laughs> like, massage the rest of these in before we go straight yeah. to Mummy and turn everybody's brains off. I mean, look. <laughs> I mean, look, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a fun theory. It's a fun theory. It is. And it does connect some dots, especially if you're superstitious when it comes to luck and unluck right. or whatever... <laughs> You can be unlucky, but what is the what is the unluckiness? I guess you'd say the noun version. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, look, it was interesting. I was yeah. very, I was waiting on bated breath just to see. Were you thinking it was going to be like Imhotep rose from the the juicy mummy starts no. sucking them dry? <laughs> I, I was, I was from <laughs> deck to deck. I mean, you know? it did, yeah, it suck them dry. Um, there was there was a boat that was on fire in that movie. There was. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Like hey, saw that recently. Of, looks like I got all the horses. <laughs> hey, Benny, <laughs> looks like you're, you're on, on the wrong side, side of the river. river. Oh, Aww. Brandon Fraser. <laughs> I'm glad he's he's he has a comeback. Um, look, I was just interested to see if it was how you'd piece that one together. Not me. Right, right, this right. This is right. honestly this my is, first time a, hearing it. But, yeah, this uh, is a you know the notes piece yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. But I was like, okay, this will mm-hmm. be a fun one. Always down for a fun theory. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, we have fun. We talk, I mean, that's the thing. We have our opinions. We, we have our, the things that we believe. But we always come into this with an open mind. We always come into this to discuss what is out there. And if there are wrinkles, we're going to be honest about it. But yeah. if there are things that, like the Olympic or even the fire that just seem really, really gripping, mm-hmm. it is what it is. True. Man, the, the, the theory, the, the first one about switching the boats. Yeah. Has. I... I that feel took like took you for a ride. Took you for a ride, dude. I feel like I might make a standalone like short video just on the Olympic oh, we should. theory we as should. it is. Yes. Just I don't know, on TikTok or on our YouTube shorts or something. I don't know. I'll put it somewhere. Yeah, that, that was fun to listen to. Yeah. That theory alone. I was so eager to hand these photos to you for you to and I'm so happy, like, because there's a lot of little round portholes and it's and it's kind of hard to follow what the person was saying a little bit. But you keyed in exactly no, on what no, I wanted you to see. So, to, they see and follow it. And again, yeah, Task Force yeah, will have that up in the socials and the YouTube video. And so that way you guys can see. The- yeah, 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 for sure. But that is the Titanic, the story of the Titanic, but also the conspiracy theories that come along with it. And I do want to just give a little shout out to our sister podcast. If you like what we do on Red Web, I think you're, this sounds so much like an ad, but I mean it. Like there are good, good friends. Ship Hits the Fan is the name of the podcast. They do what we do, but it's all about disasters on the sea. And I'm sure Mm -hmm. they have covered the Titanic at some point. So if you want to hear their take on it, go check them out. They've actually covered, what was the one with the aisles, uh, with the lighthouse and the people that disappeared? 
I oh. forget the name. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they also did an episode on that, right? The so Flannan Isles Lighthouse. The, yeah, uh. you, God, you got a memory on you. But um, yeah, so if you if you want a little bit more true crime in your life and you want a little bit more mystery, this one's thematic around boats, head over there. Very good friends of ours. Yeah, you want wet crimes. Ooh, wet <laughs> crimes. I mean, the soggiest. Yeah, the, the, yeah, just crimes out in the open sea. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, I, I have I have a, a really wild one to suggest to them at some point, but this has been the Titanic. Tell me, t hit me with it. Like, I took you on a roller coaster of a yeah. familiar story with mm -hmm. new details and conspiracy you've never heard of. Where is your mind sitting at in the fallout of this episode right now? Before we uh, head out? I think there were it was just an unfortunate event that mm -hmm. happened, and it's because of the mix up of the radio that. Mm -hmm they were not warned and that led to the collapse of the Titanic. That being said, this is something that, I mean, this is why I love being on this podcast, right? Is you went Titanic and went awesome. I know about it. You know, one of the very yeah. few things. And then here we go with, with the swapping of the boat. It goes, but did and, you know and about it? Yeah. The, like there was a coal fire and that fire, like, you know, you know, stayed burning days before. And oh, by the way, a little tidbit, there was a there was a town that was above a coal mine and that coal mine still burning decades later. It's just like, yeah, it just it's a fun time being here. I'm just a little uh, fountain of facts, you know? Yeah, you know, we just, got the chair. We got the, the well, I guess I could change my I, name I, from I, Squealing I Piggy to the to the fountain. The fountain? <laughs> if, if, you're, yeah. if you're thirsty for knowledge, you're right. to the fountain. <laughs> I my, got facts <laughs> pouring out. My cup of knowledge was overflowing. <laughs> it was overflowing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, I, I don't know if we talked about it in this episode or, the, or last week's episode, but stay tuned. We're going to do a whole, like, in, a, in about a month, maybe just less, we're going to do a whole live stream event, shopping event for the Sippy Cup of Knowledge. Actually, good news. It's looking like the date for that live stream is March 9th. So mark your calendars, get ready to be there. We'll let you know if it changes, but right now, March 9th is the day. We're going to... Sit down for like an hour with all of you guys. That's a damn thing. And we're gonna we're gonna imbue, imbibe these uh, sippy cups with knowledge and facts. So as you buy them, we will put facts into them. Right? We will speak them into the air. So when they come to you, they're hefty with knowledge. You can't sell them, sell these sippy cups of knowledge with no knowledge. That's, yeah, that's false claims. Yeah, I mean, look, you'll have knowledge written in it. I won't. Hmm. You know, grip it and rip it. <laughs> you'll have you'll have uh, uh, your own little just little something knowledges little run idioms. don't walk yeah <laughs> you know uh, just tips yeah Alfredo's tips don't look back don't do it <laughs> just don't all right well this has been man task force let us know what you thought as always hit us up on social redweb at roosterteeth.com and I just poked back in on the reviews on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify. Spotify has been popping off. Has it? We're almost at 9,000 reviews. Still oh, sitting wow. at a solid 4.9. Thank you all so much for just pouring out. Like, like I pour facts, you pour out those fives. I really appreciate it. You know? So if uh, whether you can get in on that sippy cup of knowledge or not, something you can do for free with nothing but your time mm -hmm. is reviewing this podcast or sharing it with someone Share it with a friend of yeah. yours who thinks they know the Titanic and then blow their little brain cell with these little right. numbers. You and, know what I mean? And, and just so I know, because you task force give me way too much power, mm. you haven't reviewed it yet and you're going to review it, just just put Jiggy with it. Right. <laughs> little five, code name. five stars, Jiggy with it. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? The whole and time, then, <laughs> I, was, I was Jiggy just with because it. because you guys give me way <laughs> too much power and that way I can look and go, ah, that's a Titanic episode. You can also, that one. Listen, if you want to like soften his power level, just say JWI. You know, just, just throw out a little acronym. Um, but yeah, Task Force, thank you all so much. Fredo, next week, I got another mystery for you right here on Monday. Get your thirsty mouths ready. Ready.